I'm here with Alexander Mercurius, Editor-in-Chief of the Duran. Alexander, we have Tuesday the opening arguments for the impeachment trial in the Senate. We also have the Lev Parnas information that the Democrats are relying heavily on, actually, which I think we pretty much called it, that they were going to be using that as their smoking gun, and they're trying to submit that into evidence as well. So get into what you think is going to play out as we enter the Senate with this impeachment trial. Indeed. Well, I, I ploughed through the two sets of submissions uh, uh, shortly before we did this video. I mean, the the uh, Democrat one, um, which, again, is clearly uh, largely drafted by Adam Schiff, goes on for, I, I think it's 111 pages. I mean, it just absolutely goes on and on and on. And it's, I mean, one of the things about Adam Schiff is that he never uses one word when he can get away with five, and it has that kind of quality. It's just, it's just, it's just, it's just incredibly prolonged and uh, overcomplicated. And I mean, he just he didn't say anything new. By contrast, the Republicans, and uh, it was uh, Secolo and um, the other man, Ch Ch Cipollone, whatever his name is, they produced a six-page, six-page response um though apparently there's going to be a more detailed response coming which basically makes the points we've been making in video after video this is there is no crime there is no evidence of wrongdoing no clear evidence of wrongdoing has been found or is alleged all the witnesses that have been produced by the democrats and I want to stress produced by the Democrats because the Democrats were in charge of the investigation in the House and they went through all the witnesses they seem to want to call. All of those witnesses, as we've pointed out, are secondhand witnesses. They have no direct evidence that Donald Trump was involved or did anything. And as they rightly point out in these six pages, the transcript, the, the, the uh, record, of the famous conversation between Zelensky and Trump, which took place on the 25th of July 2019, does not bear out in any way the allegations that the Democrats are making. Now, this six-page document looked to me as if it was going to suggest to that the, the some people within Donald Trump's legal team might be thinking of asking for the Republicans simply to dismiss this whole case when it finally does go to the Senate. And the counter that we've seen from the Democrats, as we've described, is the, the, this point that these the, the Trump's lawyers are making is not re legally really arguable. If this was a criminal case, if this was an actual real court case, it's very difficult to see this going beyond initial submissions. But what the Democrats are now trying to do, perhaps in order to prevent this case being simply struck out before it even begins, is that they're trying to weave into it these allegations that are being, that have been made by Lev Parnas. Now, we discussed those in detail in a recent video, but since... We did that video. I've also read an article by Byron York in the Washington Examiner, in which Byron York points out, firstly, that um, Parnas has, uh, you know, an absolutely terrible past. I mean, he's got uh, uh, various, a whole collection of criminal offences for dishonesty. But also, um, this information that he's providing has actually been provided before by him. So it's not even really new. So the Democrats already had this. They could have weaved this into their uh, uh, submissions uh, and weaved it into their actual, uh, you know, grounds of their articles of impeachment earlier if they would wanted to. But of course, for some reason, they didn't, probably because they didn't really want to call Parnas. In fact, I can say definitely because they didn't want to call Parnas as a witness in the House uh, in the House proceedings, because people like Nunes and Jordan would have simply taken him apart. But that's probably that. That's probably the background. So what is now being set up is this battle, which is going to happen, I think, on Tuesday in which the, Democrat, uh, the Democrats will make this one, I think, last final attempt 
to try to get the Republicans to agree to call witnesses. And we will see whether these Republican senators, these, these soft senators, um, Romney, Collins, I think is another one. I think there's a third one, whether they, whether they will hold with the other Republicans or whether they will wobble. We will see. Yeah, I mean, the whole goal of this is not to impeach Trump. The whole goal of this is to try to get three or four senators to flip Republican senators. I think that that would be a victory claimed by the Democrats if they can do that. And I think Romney is a possibility. I don't know about the other guys. No, I don't know about the other guys. And Collins and, you know, they're... Yeah, they're flip flopping a little bit. They're yeah. they're you know a little wobbly, but I think Romney there is a chance. I Romney, think there, there is, is a chance. chance I think there is, flip. but he he's not enough by himself. I don't think right. He's, he's not an, exactly. Yeah. He's, they need more. They need, they need a more. good three or four. Yeah, exactly. That's what they're aiming for. And I think the reason, just to go back on your previous point, I think the reason the Democrats now are using the Parnas stuff <laughs> is I think they didn't have a narrative for it because no. the Democrats are all show. They're all yeah. narrative. Yeah. And I think after, you know, you had Maria Yovanovitch testifying, they made her to be this victim, you know, oh, the big bully in the White House, he fired me and poor mm. me, you know, poor me for being fired and mm. all this stuff. I think then they had their chance to weave in the parness, yeah. you know, scribbles on, on napkins and stuff like that is his mm. surveillance on, on the ambassador, all that stuff. So, you know, they could weave in that. Marie Yovanovitch was dismissed by Trump and bullied by Trump narrative in there. I think they well, needed her testimony in order to utilize Parnas. Exactly right. That's what I, I think they needed. That is exactly true. Yeah. So I, I think that's exactly why they, they, they couldn't uh, use it before. Uh, but after Marie Yovanovitch, well, they were able to utilize it. They, well, this is why Yovanovitch was called. I mean, she was called as a witness in order to make it possible to bring it, to bring Parnas along. Now, you see, if you conduct an investigation like this properly, firstly, you call Yovanovitch, fine. Then you call Parnas. They didn't really want to call Parnas because I said that Parnas is really a terrible witness. Uh, um, if he'd been subjected to proper cross-examination, he would have rapidly and completely fallen apart so they didn't do him i mean can you imagine what it, what would have happened with people like jordan and nunes asking questions of parnas both about his past and his antecedents and if uh, um, parnas had produced cocktail napkins <laughs> as his yeah, evidence i exactly. mean it would have been an absolute shambles so they didn't want to do that they so they they they, they held him back and they produced him now and they're trying to produce him now, not because they really want to call him in the Senate trial, but in order to make the case look stronger than it actually is, even though the Parnas evidence has actually no relevance to the case, as we discussed in the previous video. I mean, it, it's the whole thing has an absolutely, I mean, you know, cuckoo land quality. It's, it's, you know, if I was an American, if I was an American citizen, I would be furious about this because this is the Senate of the United States. This is an impeachment of the president of the United States. And it's been re reduced to this low farce in which, you know, you, you make up your case as you go along. You come up with these preposterous stories and, and you, you change your position all the time you know one day it's this one day it's you know a, a Sondland and his guesses the next day it's uh, a Parnas comes along and comes up with his things then you you know you you have the whistleblower remember him <laughs> I mean it's very funny how the whistleblower you can't say the name you can't say the name, but you know he's now vanished I mean we don't have we don't really concern ourselves about him anymore so um what is this after all? I mean, this is this is not a, a, this is not a trial. It's a Monty Python sketch. I mean, this is what it's beginning to look like. I mean, it, it, it's just it's just it's just awful. And if I was as I said, if I was an American citizen, I would be really angry, not just at the amount of time and energy that this thing is taking up, but how how this must be looking to people around the world. And I'm not talking here just about people in Europe who are, you know, following the story, but, you know, they're, they're very influenced by uh, uh, their own media, which is tends to be very anti-Trump. But there are lots of other countries where, you know, China, Russia, wherever, where, you know, America is being made to look ridiculous 
because this thing is ridiculous. And um, as I said, to me, it's 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 an almost parody of a trial. Uh, and I do hope, I do hope that you know Chief Justice Roberts and the Republicans hold together. Uh, and and bring this fast to an end. I would have wanted a real trial with all the witnesses called, you know, not just Hunter Biden, but you know Comey, um, Lisa Page, you know, the, well, you know Rosenstein, all of them, you know, going all stretching all the way back to the beginnings of Russia, which is what, what Donald Trump wanted. But if we're not going to have that, and that apparently has been ruled out, which is I think a shame, then let's not waste any more time with this nonsense. Let's re reject this attempt to get witnesses and just dismiss the whole thing and then get on with the election. By the way, I, I, I do take seriously also the claim that some people, including I think Donald Trump, uh, are making that one of the reasons for holding this at this time is to prevent Bernie Sanders campaigning because he's now going to be tied up having to go through all this nonsense. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. One thing yeah. to understand that the Democrats, Alexander, is every person has their purpose for them before yeah. they, they they chew them up and spit them out or throw mm. them under the bus like they usually do. And that's why I'm saying Marie Ivanovich had a purpose. Yeah. Her purpose was to reinforce that narrative of how Trump treats women. Mm -hmm. And they're going to use that against Trump. She's done. Okay. But now that we've used her, we can move the Lev Parnas piece into place. We mm -hmm. don't want him to testify, like you said, after Marie Ivanovich, because the guy's an idiot. <laughs> but we are going to use his napkins, his scribbled napkins paper and the text that he was surveilling, <laughs> you know, Marie Ivanovich outside of the Ukraine embassy, the American embassy in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. We are going to use that to reinforce mm -hmm. the case that's coming to the Senate in order to try and once again put the pressure on three or four senators that look a little bit wobbly to try and flip them yeah. in order to use that on the campaign trail. And after everything that went down with Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, where we saw how they use Elizabeth Warren, how yes. the Democrats use Elizabeth Warren to dismantle Bernie, yes, which she was clearly used. Yes. No doubt about it was she used Absolutely. and abused by the Dems. The whole thing was a setup with CNN in on the game. I agree. That was certainly how it looked to me. 100% I mean, it set up. Uh, actually, if I may say, an, a, an appalling episode. But anyway, we'll, we, but we, we may, well, you know. We, we should probably cover that. In, I don't know if we should cover that in video. I mean, the story's kind of passed by now, but we'll think about it. Yeah. It is an interesting uh, story, yes. but there's no doubt it was a setup. Yes. And it's all done to prevent Bernie. Absolutely. And now this, like you said, plays into their hands as well, in that you'll also get a tie of Bernie as well, who's who is surging the past two, three weeks. He is exactly. surging in the polls. Exactly. And of and of course you've got a documentary that's going to be released covering Hillary Clinton. I don't know if you've heard about that, which mm. very, very much looks like a campaign promo video. Wow. Very much. Well, so I'm, once again, I'm just throwing it out mm. there. But either way, you mentioned Alexander, so you can move on and wrap up the video, move a little bit away from the, the impeachment farce. You mentioned Lisa Page. You mm. mentioned Rod Rosenstein. Yeah. You would have liked to have seen them. Peter Strzok testify. Yeah. It would be great to have seen them testify. Absolutely. It was Rod Rosenstein that mm -hmm. leaked the Lovebird texts. Indeed, right. it was. Indeed, it was. And of course, he's now coming up with his explanations about how he did it in order to protect Lisa Page and Peter Strzok. But in fact, I, I have absolutely no doubt about this. The person he was protecting was himself. He was actually making absolutely sure that this uh, um, investigation that was going on, this Mueller investigation, which he allowed to spiral completely out of control and which he must have sensed that there was a real possibility that it would all blow up in his face at some point. He wanted to make absolutely sure, this is my, my own view about it, that when evidence of the kind of things that were going on within it, with you know, Lisa Page and Peter Strzok, uh, 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 you know, he wanted to make sure that he, you know, that came out into the open so that he wasn't compromised himself. That's my own personal take on this. I'm sure many, many people who have a admiration for Rod Rosenstein, I can't imagine who they are, will disagree with me on this. But, you know, um, Rod Rosenstein, let's remind ourselves, he signed off 
on some of those FISA warrants that uh, Michael Horowitz, the FBI's Inspector General, have said were completely wrong to the point almost of being, uh, uh, well, not to the point of practically of uh, um, illegality. Um, um, he, he was also the person who appointed Mueller. He was also the person who was apparently joked about, or, or maybe he didn't joke about, you know, carrying a wire to sort of, you know, capture things that Donald Trump might be saying as a device to get Donald Trump removed for mental you know, imbalance or something of that kind. And he was the person who allowed the Mueller investigation to continue for at least a year, well, for more than a year, after all the information had come to light that proved conclusively that there was no actual Russia Gate case. So, you know, I have no real time for Rod Rosenstein. I don't take him very seriously. And I have to say, frankly, when I hear that, you know, he published these texts, um, well, I think that he was doing, he did it to protect for no other reason than to protect himself. That's my view. What does this tell you about the DOJ and the FBI, Alexander? To well, wrap it up? Uh, I mean, they're all nasty people, aren't they? Lisa yeah, Page and Peter Strzok talking about overthrowing the United States president, talking about a coup, talking nasty yeah. stuff about the people that voted yeah. for Trump. Rod Rosenstein signing all those FISA warrants, also looking to you know get rid of Trump and, and all these things. And they're all working together. And then one day, the one guy backstabs the other. I hear that Lisa Page is furious. I think she actually yeah. came out with a comment, a statement, how furious she is. Absolutely. that it was indeed Rod Rosenstein that took the knife and stabbed her right in the back and then turned it a little bit. I mean, well, he, just she, she, nasty people. Comey leaking left and right. Nasty yeah. people. Well, can I just say, Lisa Page is actually right. She's got a she's got a point. Whatever you may think of how she conducted herself, I I, I mean, the, the correct thing for Rod Rosenstein to have done, if he, once he found out about these texts, <laughs> one wonders when he did find out about these texts. By the way, but once he found out about these texts, was to call the two of them to, before him and say to him, "Look, I I've seen these texts. I don't think you can go on working for the FBI." And you might want to consider your positions and get lawyers. What he does instead is that he goes off and leaks all these texts and then comes up with this absolutely crackpot story that he did it because he wanted to protect them by leaking them in advance before the Republicans got their hands on them. I, you know, that's not an explanation. That's no sort of explanation. And you're perfectly right. I mean, everybody in the Justice Department seems to have been plotting in some form or another. Comey was plotting against Trump. He was spying on Trump and, you know, recording all the things that he was spying and taking all his records away, even though they didn't belong to him. So uh, uh, Comey was spying on Trump. McCabe was leaking all over the place. Lisa Page uh, and Peter Strzok were bragging about how, uh, um, you know, they were going to bring down Trump or what a terrible man Trump was. There was the plot against Michael Flynn, who apparently is now trying to withdraw his guilty plea. We, you know, this nonsensical business about, you know, the Logan Act and Flynn being basically set up to, to try and trap him into, uh, um, you know, uh, a lot in, in, into an, a lying, lying against the FBI. You have or the FBI getting all this information from uh, Christopher Steele's source that, you know, Christopher Steele had made, you know, his, his, his uh, dossier was absolute nonsense and pressing ahead with an investigation in spite of it. We have all the, you know, Bruce Orr being set up to get all this information, you know, through a back channel from Christopher Steele, who had supposedly been sacked as an informer. I mean, this is this organization is just a complete and dangerous mess. I is clearly, as I say, everybody's plotting, everybody's scheming, everybody's trying to find some way of bringing Donald Trump down because that's clearly the agenda. They're signing off Pfizer warrants, which I mean, I you know make no sense, and as I said, border certainly border on on, on illegality, and perhaps tip over the border into illegality. We see, we'll see what Durham and Barr say. But I mean, whatever one thinks about this, the 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 just Justice Department 
as it was headed by Loretta Lynch and Sally Yates, had become a cesspool. <laughs> That's the only word I can use to describe it. Yeah, no honor amongst thieves, no honor among amongst swamp creatures. Well, absolutely not. I mean, an absolute cesspool. I mean, it's the only it's the only word I can think of. I mean, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I should say I've worked in dysfunctional organizations. I've just worked in dysfunctional public organizations. I've never seen anything like this. I mean, this Departments, is, this the is, DOJ, and the FBI. Well, and I know. Well, exactly. The CIA will lump that in there as well. Throw it on. This, this is I know. incredible behavior. I know. I know, absolutely. But I mean, the, all of it. The, the, the Justice Department is supposed to be responsible for the administering administering the law of the United States, and I mean, it, this is how it behaves. This is how its senior officials behave. I mean, I, I as I said, I'm just you know incredulous actually, um, and. You know, the one good thing that's come out of Russiagate, if I may say so, is that we've actually seen all this exposed now. We've seen all this coming to the surface. And that's why, coming back to the original topic of our program, I would have wanted to see a proper Senate trial because um, that, you know, all of this needs to be brought into the light of day. Exactly. Alexander McCurse, Editor-in-Chief of the Durant. Thank you very much, guys. If you like this video, click on the subscribe button down below. Click on the notifications bell to make sure you get notifications every time we publish a video. Check us out on iTunes and, and SoundCloud to get an audio copy of this video. And please donate to us on Patreon, PayPal, and Subscribestar as well. Your donation really helps out the channel a lot. Please download the Telegram app on iTunes and on Google Play to keep in touch with everything that's going on in the Duran community. And check out the Duran shop. We've got magic mugs. We've got awesome apparel. We've got eBooks, Alexander. We certainly do. And again, I just start with the eBooks. You've got four of them, one on Russia Gate, one on Brexit, and two new ones on Ukraine Gate and on Epstein. And of course, Ukraine Gate is this extraordinary uh, story that we've been talking about today and we talk about how you know when you actually drill into all the allegations that have been made in Ukraine Kate there isn't anything there I mean it's a story it's a massive story about nothing put together by all sorts of powerful people as part of what is essentially a power struggle being carried out in the United States by contrast Epstein is this huge story of, a, of a, a man and his accomplices, Jeffrey Epstein, committing huge and incredibly serious crimes with lots of victims and the extraordinary lack of publicity and attention that story is getting is really extra is really worrying and it speaks for itself anyway we've published two books about them we analyze these two stories i've written prefaces for them and all the proceeds of sale of those two books and indeed of all our four ebooks are going to the fund set up for the firefighters who are fighting the fires in australia that is our way of uh, uh, showing our support for those people. It's a story we don't really know how to cover because, you know, we, this isn't the kind of thing that we cover very well, these kind of disasters. But we do recognise the tragedy of it and we are supporting them in the in the way that we think best, which is by giving them, as I said, the proceeds of sale from our e-books. But we don't just have e-books in our shop. As Alex rightly says, we have our fantastic magic mugs, 15 ounces, perfect for keeping your tea hot or your beer cold, uh, uh, beautifully made porcelain body, um, incredibly elegant to hold and drink from. As I said, I've even drunk champagne from nine. And as you can see, uh, I've had this um, mug now for almost a year and it's in perfect condition i mean it's there's no chips no cracks um, the badge of the russian federation which is on this particular one it's it, it's perfect it looks it looks absolutely perfect so all our magic mugs are are, are magnificent in the same way as are our shirts 
like the long sleeve t-shirt I'm wearing at the moment. The reason I'm wearing a long sleeve t-shirt is because it is so cold at the moment in London. In London, it's cold. Um, I've heard that in other places in Eastern Europe and in Russia, it's actually quite warm for this time of year, but London is freezing. And um, as well as long sleeve t-shirts, there's also short sleeve t-shirts, there's v-neck shirts, there are, are very beautiful and stylish polo neck shirts, all of them 100% cotton, all of them beautifully made and stitched together, uh, um, all of them, well, most of them, many of them, with the Durand double-headed eagle on them. And you can also find other, other things. You can find uh, hoodies and hats and stickers, all these wonderful things there on our shop. Uh, you can, if you go to our shop, you can buy them, you can support us at the Durand so that we can continue to do these programs for you. You can also be the owner of these things and you're helping the, the, the uh, firefighters in Australia. So Alex will tell you how to go to the shop and please do. The DurandShop.com. You'll find all the links in the description box down below. Alexander McCurse, Editor-in-Chief of the Durand. Thank you very much. Until next time, everybody, take care.